Boo! <laughs> well, I'm, I'm Chuck Willis, and as you can see on my uh, presentation here, this uh, talk is called Trends in Licensing of Security Tools. Sorry, I'm going to try to keep speaking into the mic. If, uh, if you can't hear me or anything, just you know, give me one of these or uh, just say something. I want to make sure that uh, you guys can hear what I'm saying, and, and I also want to hear what you're saying. You know, this is meant to be an interactive presentation, and, and uh, in a way it's good. We've got a small crowd here that we can, uh, maybe people will feel more free to talk a little bit about this, because I, I certainly don't intend to come up here and say that I have all the answers. It's really just more of a kind of uh, my slides are going to try to provoke some thoughts from you all and uh, give kind of what my thoughts on are as far as uh, where licensing is going and security tools and, and uh, what might be some problems with that. So anyway, as I mentioned, I'm Chuck Willis. Um, these slides are a little updated from what's on your uh, CD, so you can go to my website and download them if you want. There's nothing real substantial in the way of changes. And just uh, in case you uh, couldn't figure it out from the title, so what we're going to be doing is uh, I, I want to discuss uh, the trends as far as the kind of the changes that I've seen in licensing of security tools and, uh, and also talk about how that affects the security community. And uh, I also want to discuss, you know, how licensing could be improved if, if necessary. I mean, maybe, maybe you all think there's not a problem with what's going on. And, uh, and also, as kind of a, kind of a secondary thing, uh, you, I expect that, you know, maybe some of you all will learn something about uh, security tool licenses in that there's a lot of tools that I'm going to talk about that um, you think are, are free open source tools that, that really aren't. And again, this, this is meant to be interactive. So I'm, I'm going to ask a lot of questions, and I hope that you all will, will have some, uh, some thoughts and share, share those with us. Uh, just a few disclaimers here. Um, I, I am going to talk about specific tools that have uh, restrictions in their licenses. And uh, this is not meant to be like just ragging on these people or you know, trying to talk bad about people. But I just think it makes the talk much more interesting if you've got concrete examples to talk about rather than a bunch of abstract stuff. Um, and, I, and I do think that the authors of those tools have done a service to the community by releasing them under the license that they're under. I mean, they could, a lot of the tools that I'm going to mention could easily be you know, strictly commercial tools that you have to spend thousands of dollars for. So certainly the authors are to be commended for what they've done. And also, I wouldn't be talking about the tool if I didn't think it was a useful tool that people, uh, people use. So I'm not going to be talking about real obscure stuff, I don't think. And uh, finally, the licenses may have changed since I put these slides together. Uh, licenses change all the time. So this is uh, the, just a disclaimer there that stuff might have changed since I put this together. And the, you need to go out and read the license if you're going to use these tools. You know, this, don't just rely on what I'm going to tell you. Okay, so a little bit about me. Um, I, I work for a government contractor. Um, I don't work for, and yeah, the reason I say that is I don't work for a consulting firm or a software firm, which is who releases most of the security tools as far as companies. And then a lot of security tools are released just by individuals that do it in their spare time. So I think I'm a, a bit independent in that sense. Um, I'm not a free software zealot. I'm not going to come up here and say that everything should be GPL, because um, I, I don't think that's the case. And I use commercial software along with open source software and all sorts of other software. And, and again, I'm not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. So, but I, I do think I'm a pretty typical security tool user. I mean, I, I use a lot of tools in my work and also at home when I'm messing around with stuff. And, uh, and I, and I kind of wanted to illustrate this to show that uh, you guys, I think, are typical security tool users as well, but we're different from normal software users. You know, I, I use both Linux and Windows. I occasionally use other Unix variants, but um, you can't say that certainly about standard software. Most people just run Windows. Um, and, and also, I'm not a full-time programmer, so I don't necessarily have access to all the programming tools, Visual Studio and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and also, I'm, I, can, I can tinker around with stuff, but I'm not necessarily someone that w wants to spend all day coding. But I, but I compile tools. That's certainly uh, something that we can all do. Uh, we can debug compilation issues if you've ever had to port something from Linux to Windows under like the SIGWIN um, APIs or to BSD or something like that. I'm, I'm sure that's something that's pretty typical for people here. Um, and I, I like to build little tools and scripts to automate things. I hate doing busy work, you know. So I, I like to be able to do that kind of stuff. And I also, I modify tools, that if I download a tool from the internet or from something that someone has posted to a mailing list, 
I'm, I'm going to take it and start tweaking it if it's not doing exactly what I want. And I also like to share my tools and modifications with other people. So if I, if I do something I think is cool, I post it onto a mailing list. So anyway, I, I wanted to just mention that because again, I think this kind of fits everyone that's here, but it's definitely different than normal software users. So my motivation here was that I, I use a lot of security tools as I mentioned, and, and I actually read the licenses, which maybe uh, not everybody does. But uh, I've actually been quite surprised by some of the stuff I've found. Uh, a lot of tools that I thought were open source really aren't, and a lot of tools that uh, just have some very strange license restrictions that, uh, that kind of surprised me. And, and over the years, I've noticed some trends that, you know, it seems like more tools are going to more restrictive license. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. So here's a quick example here. And, uh, so uh, SensePost's WIC2 tool, it's a, it's a Windows version of uh, NIC2 kind of. It, it's got some other features actually that is built onto the NIC2. Uh, it does some recursion and it's also uh, connects in with the Google uh, APIs and all that. So anyone here use that tool, find it useful? Yes, no? Okay, good. Um, are any of the contributors here? I, I definitely know they're here at the conference. I, I sat in on SensePost's talk earlier. I don't see any of them in the room here. Well. It, you're, you're lucky they're not in the room because uh, if you look at the license for WIC2, you'll see that it starts off with the, the full GPL license and then it adds this extra restriction that basically if uh, you find the software useful, you're supposed to buy them a drink. So I expect you all to go out and find them after the session's over and make sure you live up to that. Excuse me? WIC2, it's a web, it's a web uh, application scanner, web server scanner. So. And just in case anyone was wondering, I, I don't think that's enforceable, but I'm not a lawyer, so you'll have to talk to your legal about that. Well, it certainly is a violation of the GPL in the sense of, well, it's not a violation of the GPL, but it's not the GPL. You, you can't say that something is GPL and then add extra restrictions onto it. I don't think the, real, the two really match. But if you also, if you notice the wording there, it says, you know, it's kind of vague in the wording too, so. It's, to be honest, it's probably a joke, so I don't think they actually expect anyone to do that. But it's just one of those little nuggets that you'll see sometimes in reading licenses. So the, uh, just a little bit about the scope. That the main thing I'm interested in when I'm talking about these licenses is being able to use the tool for what I want to do and perhaps modify the tool and be able to you know, send those modifications to other people. So in particular, I'm not trying to take someone else's tool and build my own tool that I want to sell and make a million dollars for. Um, that's much more difficult as far as licensing. Obviously, GPL restricts that in a lot of ways. Uh, the BSD license or other licenses like that can allow that, but that's kind of a different issue for me. So that's what we're going to talk about. So let's start off with uh, the trends that I've noticed. And there's quite a few of them here, but there's two kind of overwhelming ones that we start off with. And the, the first one is that there's a lot of great open source tools out there that, that are under an OSI certified license. That would be mo usually the GPL uh, or a BSD license. And uh, you all can read the list. I'm sure you've heard, heard, and heard about and used a lot of these tools, you know, the Nmap and Ethereal. And the Metasploit framework is written in Perl. Um, almost all tools that are written in Perl are released under uh, Perl's license, the artistic license, which is uh, basically, you know, it's an open source license, OSI certified. Um, so I think these people deserve a lot of credit for what they've done. And, and everyone who's written open source software, contributed to open source software, that uh, they've done a lot of great service for the community here. And uh, I just wanted to say this up front to make so that when I start talking about all the other tools later, that it doesn't sound like you know, everything's a problem. Uh, there's certainly a lot of great, uh, truly open source software out there. And, but I do see that uh, more security tools are strictly commercial. And when I say strictly commercial, I say that basically if you want to use the tool, you've got to pay money. Um, they, they may have some sort of free version that allows you to download it and try it out for 30 days or on a certain number of IP addresses or something. But for the most part, it's a, uh, it's a commercial tool. And, uh, and unfortunately, those commercial tools restrict many of the things that security tool, security tool users want to do. And uh, that's really one of the things we're going to talk about for the, this session is a lot of those restrictions. And uh, so I guess I'll just kind of throw the question out there. Is, is, is there a place for commercial security tools? You guys think yes, no? Shake your head. A lot, a lot of blank stares. Well, I, I, I do. I don't, like I said, I'm not an open uh, 
free software uh, zealot. I think that there's a place for commercial security tools, especially when there's not an open source equivalent. If, if people are willing to pay money for it, then, then that makes sense. But um, my other question would be, should commercial security tools be licensed differently from other software? Yes or no? Again, more blank stares. And I, I think definitely yes. I think commercial, commercial security tool users are much different than other tool users or other software users. So I think that the license can allow the kind of things that we want to do. And some tools do have pretty, um, pretty uh, how do you say, less restrictive licenses. Um, IDA Pro, for example, allows you to re reverse engineer it, which is kind of funny because it's a reverse engineering tool. But I guess they kind of saw that that was kind of a, uh, something that a lot of commercial software doesn't allow you to do. And, uh, and also, if you look at uh, some of the vulnerability uh, penetration testing tools like uh, Core Impact or Canvas, that those are commercial software that you have to pay for, but they come with all the source code. So you can go ahead and modify the tool if you want to, which is a, which is a nice thing. And it's certainly something that security tool users want to do. And uh, the other kind of overarching uh, theme that I've seen is that a lot of tools are released with what I call a custom license, which is basically somewhere between commercial and open source. So there's a, it permits some uses without cost. Usually it means that if it's uh, you know, for personal use or for non-commercial use, it'll say you can use it. Um, but it, it usually requires either payment or something like that for something else. And it restricts some of the other things that we want to do uh, that we'll get into later. And that's really what I'll talk about for the rest of this session is, is those restrictions and, uh, and tools that have them. And, and just as kind of an aside, that many of these tools that are kind of somewhere between open source and commercial are released by companies and not individuals. And that's because um, the companies have, have put money into developing this tool and they want to use it either they're going to sell it to people or they want people to know that it came from them, that they don't want other people releasing uh, modified versions of the tool and that sort of thing. Yes? A bait and lure? Um, how, how do you mean that? Oh, certainly. Uh, some, some tools are like that. Uh, uh, like uh, they'll have a, a more restricted version that uh, maybe only works for up to a certain number of IP addresses or whatever. And even, even if you look at something like Nessus, which I'll get into more a little later, um, Nessus is a great vulnerability scanner, but it doesn't necessarily scale real well. And one of the things that Tenable, the company that, uh, that is pretty much in charge of Nessus now, that they, uh, they have some like web interfaces and other consoles that they'll sell you that uh, allow you to manage uh, Nessus scanners. So yeah, certainly it is part of it. That it's, it's really marketing is what it comes down to to a large extent that a lot of these companies, the consulting type companies, you know, they release free tools because they want to draw people to their website and, uh, and be able to then sell them consulting services and software and all that sort of stuff. Okay, so now let's get a little bit more into the specifics. Uh, and, and the first one is just basically that, that you, sometimes you have to pay to use these tools. And, uh, and usually these are tools, like I said, that can be used for free in some situations and then uh, in other situations you've got to pay. And uh, sometimes they, the license will say that the tool is for like personal use or non-commercial use, but there's, it doesn't say anything about if you want to use it commercially, how to buy it or how much it costs and there's no information on their website or anything. And that is very confusing for users that it kind of, to me, it's like if you're gonna, if you want to charge money or you don't want people to use your software for commercial use, you should make it easy for them to stay within the law. You should make it easy for them to buy the software if they want to buy it. And uh, so that's kind of confusing. And also, uh, here's some examples of that, and uh, you can read through those. Um, THC's "Are You There?" and is a is a tool that requires uh, permission. It doesn't, you, you don't have to pay for it, but it does require permission. And I lump payment and permission together because. I kind of think that if you require permission for people to use it for commercial use, then you're kind of leading up to maybe you're going to start charging for it later. And, uh, and it really comes down to the same, the same issues. Um, Foundstone's free tools are that way. That they, their license says it's for personal and non-commercial use, um, but it doesn't say anything about how to purchase it for commercial use. Um, the registered plugins for Nessus and also the VRT certified rules for Snort are uh, are that way as well, that you, you need to register in order to be able to download these. Uh, both of them will use very similar business models in that they, uh, um, the rules will be about five days out of date 
um, if you're going to use the uh, free of cost version. Um, and then if you want to pay, you know, I think it's for Nessus it's like uh, $1,200 a year. I don't know for Snort how much it costs to buy the uh, immediate download so that, you know, as soon as a new rule, com rule comes out, you can get it. Um, and then another tool is HTTP print, which uh, is just a little neat little web uh, server fingerprinting tool. So, anyway, any questions there? Any other thoughts as far as other tools that are kind of in this vein or um, do people think this is a big problem or not? I don't know. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the, just for people who didn't hear that, basically the idea, I think what you're saying is that uh, basically violating the license of these tools, that if it says it's only for non-commercial use and you use it commercially, that's the same as, you know, downloading, you know, Windows from the Internet, you know, on BitTorrent or whatever. It's, it's, it's piracy and the BSA can come after you for it. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. And that, and that kind of illustrates why I put this whole thing together is that, you know, in my job, I was downloading a lot of tools and I wanted to make sure that we were following the license. I didn't want to get my employer or our, our customers in trouble. So, um, yeah, it's definitely one of those things that you need to be paying attention to the licenses of the tools that you're using. Okay. Uh, another, another feature that I've seen in a lot of licenses is that more, more of them are restricting redistribution. And, uh, Basically, that means that you can only get the tool from the author, that, you know, you can only download the tool from their website, which is fine, I guess, until the, the author disappears. You know, if it's a company and it, you know, goes bankrupt or if the author, unfortunately, dies or decides he doesn't want to deal with it anymore, it, it makes it difficult that, you know, maybe a friend of yours has a copy of the tool, but then you, you, the license says you can't redistribute it. So it's one of those things that uh, it's, it's kind of a gray area. It'd be, it'd be nice if people would put in their license that, you know, if you're going to restrict redistribution, you know, allow it if the case is that uh, people can't find it from you anymore. And just some examples of those as far as tools that you might have used. Uh, the sysinternals tools are uh, a lot of like little Windows tools that uh, will show you processes that are running in that. People use them in incident response. Um, NetStumbler actually restricts redistribution. Um, and then Again, the Foundstone tools, the and Nessus and Snort plugins. So, that's the next uh, next thing that I've seen a lot of is uh, tools that restrict or prohibit uh, modification and reverse engineering, and uh, that's really it's it's a problem because this is it, it prevents us from being able to fix the tool that you know ev especially if the tools like uh, Nessus, the Nessus plugins restrict uh, modification, but. It's, it's just a script. You know, you've got the source code right there. You could easily go in there and fix things if you wanted to, but the license doesn't allow you to. And uh, note some other examples of that, uh, Cane Enable and also the Foundstone tools again and, and NetStumbler. Um, this is, like you can see, mostly an issue with, uh, with Windows tools that, you know, if you don't have the source code, it makes it difficult. But some of them, like I said, Nessus, uh, it is still an issue. And that's kind of the next issue is that a lot of tools don't come with the source code. So if you don't have the source code, it makes it very difficult to make any changes. And uh, it, while it's, so it's strictly, it's not a license issue in the sense of it's not in the license, but usually these tools that don't come with source code also have a license that restrict redistribution or restrict modification. So it's pretty much the same issue again. And, and without the source code, it's, it's very difficult to make modifications to the tool and improve the tool, try to fix them ourselves. You know, a lot of times if you're using a tool on a client site and, and something's being buggy or you're seeing that the output is weird and you want to be able to try to fix it, you know, you, you can't do that if you don't have the source code. And, uh, and also the source code is valuable just for learning purposes, that if you want to learn how this tool is working and how, you know, what kind of protocols it's using, especially if it's some sort of a, like a vulnerability scanner or a, a pen testing tool, you want to know, well, what, you know, how is it connecting to the remote system? What exactly responses are we getting back? Maybe try to weed out some false positives and that sort of thing. Well, that's, that's very difficult if you don't have the source code to know, you know, what the thing is, uh, is doing. 
And, and obviously source code is also necessary if you want to port it to another platform. So if you've got a, a Windows tool that's running a you know, standard C++ compiled program, then well you've got to want to port that over to Linux, then that's not really not possible without the source code. And uh, even even in some supposedly portable languages like Java and .NET, um, there you a lot of times run into little issues between platforms that you need the source code in order to kind of convert things. Especially if the original programmer didn't consider porting, that you know maybe they're using some Windows specific APIs that aren't available in the .NET framework for uh, for Linux and uh, OS X and that sort of thing. And again, this is mostly Windows tools, although occasionally you'll see it on other tools. Um, I don't use Macs, but probably Mac tools uh, have some of that as well. And here's a bunch of examples. Um, and some of them, some of them, I'm not sure if it was intentional that they didn't include the source code. Some of them you may be able to email the author and get it from them. Um, but these are just the ones that I saw that weren't, you know, readily available on their website. And uh, some of the new ones here, you know, Achilles. Well, Achilles is an old tool, but we haven't talked about it yet. Um, Brutus, uh, Sam Spade, and uh, Odysseus. Um, Achilles and Odysseus are web uh, proxies. And there's, a, there's actually a couple tools, uh, fortunately only two so far, that require uh, credit in the consulting reports. So if you use THC AMAP or THC Hydra as part of a penetration test or other sort of commercial uh, consulting you know, assessment that you're doing, there's actually a, a clause in the license that you have to give them credit in the consulting report. Um, I don't know how many people actually do that or not. I don't know if uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad, like I said, that only a couple tools are doing this so far because if it becomes real common, it could be real troublesome to start to remember, well, which tools did I use in this consulting and, you know, trying to get all the credits in there and making sure the customer doesn't get kind of confused as to why you've got all this stuff in your report. So is that new to anybody? I mean, did, did anybody use that tool that didn't know about that? No one wants to admit it anyway. Okay. Well, another another issue I've run into is that sometimes tools have a lot of these restrictions in their license, but then they kind of will tell you in mailing lists or, or other places that well, don't, don't worry about it. You know, we really didn't mean that, I guess. Um, and that's a little bit confusing. So sometimes, uh, in these couple examples, the website is different from what comes with the tool. So you download the tool and inside the tarball or inside the zip file is a license that's different than what you see on the website when you download the tool. Um, one example is, you know, THC Hydra and AMAP. The license is only slightly different, but there's a little difference in the, I think it's actually in the clause that I just showed you that the, the credit is different, that I think one of the licenses it says you have to include the tool name, version, and authors, and in the other one it says you only have to include the name and the version or something like that. And uh, another more significant one is uh, Foundstone recently re released a tool called uh, WS Digger. I, I believe it's a web services scanning tool, um, but don't quote me on that. Um, the license on the website is the standard Foundstone license, which we've been talking about, which is very restrictive, you know, personal and non-commercial use only, no reverse engineering, all that other stuff. But when you download the tool, inside the tool distribution is the Apache 2.0 license, which is an open source license, which allows you to do all those things that we want to do. So which license are you supposed to follow? I don't know. But from what I've seen on the, when they announced the tool that it's meant to be under the Apache license, there's just uh, some sort of miscommunication on their website. Um, another example is that uh, sometimes the author, like I said, on a mailing list or something will, will contradict the tool's license. So when you have a, a Foundstone's Hack Me Bank and their Hack Me Books tools um, are great, great tools to learn about uh, web, web applications and do some pen testing against them in a lab environment and all that. And, but again, the license says that they're personal and non-commercial use. So I emailed them because I wanted to set it up on our internal network at my company. And uh, they said, oh yeah, no problem to use it on an internal lab. You know, that they, they didn't want other people going out and, you know, teaching classes, which is part of, you know, how they make money using these tools because they put a lot of work into them, but they don't mind you using them, you know, at work personally. And that, that's something we'll, the, another issue that I've seen is that, you know, a lot of times people say personal use or non-commercial use, but they don't define that. And, and different, different companies have different definitions. Um, I know it's not a security tool, but a Google toolbar, um, it defines personal use as if you download it yourself, it's okay. So I can use Google Toolbar at work as long as I install it myself, but my system administrator can't install it on every single machine. 
Um, I don't know. It's just it's one of those things that it's different companies have different definitions. So if you're not defining it, then it's hard to it's hard to enforce it. And then another example is the 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 ton of the uh, the registered plugins for Nessus. Yes, go ahead. Right, right. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. For if you guys didn't hear, he basically said that if, like the Foundstone tools, that they were written by people at Foundstone, but Foundstone owns the copyright. They're the copyright holder for those tools, so they decide the license. And the authors of those tools don't necessarily have the authority from their employer to waive that license or change the license. So you need to be aware of that um, as far as who who actually owns the tool and are you actually getting permission from the right people. Um, the registered plugins for Nessus is another tool that's uh, a little strange because the license is very restrictive. It doesn't allow you to change the plugins or um, reverse engineer the plugins, which is a bit a bit strange because uh, there's some problems with their plugins. You know, they they always have problems with false positives or typos and descriptions and that. And nothing bad. It's just they've got six thousand of the things. So there's inevitably there's going to be problems that show up. And they've also they they frequently have problems with versions of of uh, of services that they're scanning, that you know, the, the, when a new version comes out, they're going to give you back uh, something strange that it's not expecting. So anyway, the the license prevents you from making those changes yourself or distributing them. Uh, but on the mailing lists, the the owner of Tenables, which I think is authorized to make this statement, said, "Oh yeah, no problem. You know, you can you can make changes to the plugins and you can post it back to the the Nessus mailing list so that other people can see them." So. That's another one of those things where it's like, well, who do you really follow? I mean, I would guess that you know, if, if they've said that publicly, and, and I know people have done that, and no one's gotten sued, so it's probably okay. But it's just a little confusing for the users that they really should straighten that out. And the other really big issue that I've seen is a lot of tools just don't have a license that they are, you know, you just can't find it. And and maybe the the it's a. Uh, I don't know. There, there may be, you know, some of these are, that I'm going to mention. Maybe the tools and maybe the license is in the tool distribution. It's just hard to find. I have seen ones where the binary that gets compiled or is distributed doesn't have any license at all associated with it. But if you look at like the comments in the uh, source code files, it'll say, you know, this tool is under the GPL or this tool is under whatever license, um, which is really not sufficient. You're supposed to include the, the full GPL in there rather than just saying uh, it's supposed to be GPL. Excuse me. It's supposed to be under the GPL, uh, and then sometimes the tool is just not present at all. You know, you just can't find it, and uh, and this is also a big problem if you can't figure out who the author was. If you know, the, maybe you've got an email address that doesn't work anymore or something like that. So then it's kind of like, who knows. And then the other thing is that a lot of times, there, if there is a license, it might be there, but it's pretty incomplete. That it just basically says something real simple like, oh, use it for whatever you want or something like that. Well. That isn't really a full license in the sense of it doesn't talk about all the different things that we want to be able to do with tools and give us permission for it. I, again, I'm not a lawyer, but my understanding of copyright law is that pretty much if the license doesn't say you can do it, then you're not supposed to do it. And, and a, a lot of times, this is, a, this is a problem with small exploits and scripts and stuff that are posted to, uh, I call them online forums here, just to include everything, but mailing lists, news groups. You know, if you look at uh, full disclosure or bug track mailing list, hardly any of the exploits that are posted there have any sort of license associated with them. And uh, again, it'd be, it'd be nice if, uh, if we could say, well, if you post something in a, in a forum like that and don't include a license, it's uh, it was meant to be, you know, in the public domain or something like that. But I don't think that's the way the law works. But again, I'm not a lawyer. Um, here's just some examples here. Um, a bind view is a Noom tool. I wasn't able to find a license for it. Um, Hobbit's original Netcat. Uh, there was no license associated with that. Uh, John the Ripper. Um, I, I think what happened was Solar Designer, the guy who wrote the tool, um, incorporated some other code that he wasn't sure about the license into the tool. So that's why there is no license because he he doesn't even know what the license is. But um, he has said that the next version, 1.7, is going to be released under the GPL. Um, 
but I have no idea when that's going to happen. I mean, 1.6 has been out forever, so I don't I don't know when that's going to happen. Um, and some other tools that I saw on SQLsecurity.com has a lot of SQL tools that uh, I didn't see any license for, and some other ones that we've already talked about. So, okay, where are we where are we at in time? Okay, we're we're in good shape. So. Do you guys agree that this exists? You know, I've talked a lot about, you know, I think more tools are going to this kind of um, more restrictive licenses. Do you guys agree, disagree? Um, what's, what's your thoughts? Yes, no. Yeah, go ahead. Right. The, the comment was that a lot of tools seem to be uh, that they're. It's almost like the bait, bait and uh, bait and hook method that someone else mentioned. That they they have like free tools to kind of hook you in, and then they uh, try to get you to to pay for uh, other tools or a more expanded version or something like that. And definitely, that's that's been the case in software for a long time. But in security tools, it's I think it's more of a recent trend. You know. Yes. Go ahead. Yes, I, I think that's definitely true. Um, just to repeat for people who may not have heard, is that the authors of the tools a lot of times will 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 either clarify the license if it's not there, or they'll give you the source code. But, you know, usually the, if you can get a hold of them, they're they're pretty nice about it, and they like to hear that people are using the tools. And definitely, that's that's one of my recommendations uh, that we'll get to later on. Is you know, yeah, work work with those people to see what the uh, what the license is if it's not uh, if it's not clear. But uh, yeah, I I agree. Yeah, go ahead. I I am not a lawyer. I don't know. Okay. I I would say no, just offhand. That you know, again, if someone posts something to full disclosure or bug track with no license attached, I'm assuming he means people can use it for something at least. But I don't know. I don't know. And that, well, that's actually something we'll get into in a little bit. But what, what's your thoughts? Yeah, that's that's a good point. Just real quick summary was that you know that there there may be an implied license there that if someone has released a tool where anyone in the world can get to it either on a mailing list or a website that you could make the argument that they intended for people to be able to use it for for things. Again, talk to your lawyer and it, it may de probably depends a lot on what country you're in. Yes. Again, I'm not a lawyer, but my my understanding is that a license is similar to a contract, and just because you and I sign a contract doesn't necessarily mean that everything is enforceable. And I don't know all the exact caveats, but I know, for instance, I can't sign a contract saying that I'll be your slave for the rest of my life, that that is not a legally enforceable contract. So anyway. Um, 
let me move on to another question. So, and I think we've kind of covered this, but I'll ask it more specifically is, is there a problem with this? And we have a, certainly identified a problem of, you know, if stuff doesn't have a license and it's kind of in, in limbo, that it'd be good to have some clarification there. But um, with reference to the other trends that we've seen as far as more, more tools requiring uh, payments and uh, permission for uses and all that, is, it, does that, is that a problem for the security community? Yes, no. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And uh, the quickly uh, summary of it was that, uh, yeah, that some, some tools out there, even security tools that are restricting reverse engineering and crypt analysis of them, that really causes a problem for us that want to be able to evaluate these tools and decide are they good or bad uh, to deploy into our companies or to recommend to our customers and, and that sort of thing. So that, that certainly is a problem. Okay, uh, next question was, uh, well, what, what can we do to improve security tool licensing. I've got my own thoughts that, uh, that I'll talk about in a little bit, but I just want to hear what you guys have to say. Anyone got any suggestions? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Make a new license. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and that was, that's, that's definitely one of my points uh, that I'll talk about later is that, yeah, if you, it would be great if people want an open source product make it an OSI approved license. Don't make up your own license because it'll run into a lot of these problems and it makes it confusing for the users. That yeah, it's, it's hard, especially because of the nature of security tool work, that we end up using a lot of little tools to do our work. And it's very, it's, it's a pain to be able to try to keep track of the licenses of all these tools and make sure that we're not you know, doing something that we're not supposed to be doing. Any other suggestions before uh, mine? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, that's, that's definitely a good point. Uh, the, the point was that we, if you're buying a security product, or even if you're using it for free, it, it, but mostly if you're buying it, is you know, talk to the authors or whoever tried to sell this to you and, and tell them you don't like the license. Tell them that you want a different license, especially for as much money as we pay for a lot of the security products. That uh, it's amazing that the, the kind of restrictions that they want to put on what we can do, and the fact that people just accept them, you know, and just kind of treat it like any other piece of software that they're going to, well, we just got to live with it. Well, no, you don't have to live with it, especially a lot of these smaller companies that are selling these things that, you know, they, they want your business and they're willing to make concessions, and especially if they um, can understand that what they're trying to restrict is really not, um, it's, it's, it's restricting what we want to do with the tools. And, and it really comes down to, I think, don't treat your users like criminals, you know? If you're, you're not giving them source code and you're preventing them from re, re, uh, reverse engineering the tool, well, you're, you're kind of assuming that, oh, they want to do something bad to us. Well, no, we just want to be able to use the tool, is what it comes down to, and being able to use it in the most efficient way that we know how. Okay, I got 10 minutes left. Okay, any, any other suggestions? Okay, I'll, I'll run through what I have on here, and it, it's really just kind of my own, you know, thoughts. Feel free to disagree or, or uh, whatnot. A um, few, few issues for uh, tool users. Well, obviously, read and follow the licenses. You know, you, you can't just ignore, ignore the issue. And if you, don't like the, if you don't like the license, don't use the tool. Or at least go back to the author and say, hey, can we get this changed? But don't just ignore it and kind of go on and do whatever you want. And... I'd also say, uh, I call it legal trickery, but just be, don't, 
use the, uh, don't follow the letter of the license while violating the spirit of the license. And, and a lot of that comes down to, to uh, you know, how you define, you know, commercial use and that kind of thing. You know, if, if you don't, don't get into that, it would be my recommendation. And uh, again, work with the writer, the tool writers to clarify if there's a problem. And, and the key there is politely, because tool, tool writers uh, have a lot of times, you know, if, especially if they're writing it on their own, you know, they're, they're not getting paid to do it. They have a lot of people emailing them with bugs and stuff like that. And, you know, you don't want to make demands of them, but just talk to them and usually they'll be pretty uh, accommodating. And, and also encourage them to remove the license restrictions, which is uh, good for everybody. And, and also, if you, if you make changes to a tool, um, whether it be an open source tool or any other tool, you know, share the changes. You know, allow all of us to work together on these things so that everyone's not out you know, reproducing the same you know, events. Okay, well, tool writers, well, you just, obviously, you need to follow the license for any software that you're incorporating into your tool. Um, in particular, you know, if you've got like GPL software or something, you can't cut, cut and paste that into a commercial product. Um, choose, choose a license and include it with every tool. That's uh, kind of self-explanatory. And, and remember, you know, if the copyright holder can add another license at any time. So just because I release a tool under the GPL today doesn't mean that every version of that tool is always going to be GPL. I can release the next version of it under a completely different license. That's, that's not a problem because I own, I own the work. And if your employer holds the copyright, then encourage them to use a less restrictive license or just a standard open source license. That, that can go a long way to just you know, telling your boss, you know, hey, this is what, we wanna, what users are going to want to be able to do with this tool, and we think it will be helpful in the long run. Because especially if the company is trying to release the tool as you know, marketing and, and being able to draw people to their site, well, the more people that use the tool, the better it is for them. Um, just a quick, a quick note of, you know, don't make a, don't make a, some complicated restrictive license for a pretty simple tool. You know, if it's, if it's a simple tool, just release it under, you know, a BSD license or, or a GPL or something real simple. And, and also say, say what you mean and mean what you say when you're uh, licensing the tool. Don't, don't do this kind of, well, the license says you can't do it, but then I'm going to email people and say that they can. And, and again, if you, if you want it to be open source, just use an OSI standard license. Don't make up your own. And it, if you're going to require payments, well, obviously you need to make the cost reasonable or people aren't going to buy it. Make, make it easy for the people to buy the tool, that they can find it on your website, that you've got a link, that you, people can go to a secure form, put in their credit card information, and download the tool. You know, you're, you're going to get more people buying it that way than if they've got to email you and, and try to figure out what's going on. And that's pretty much what's there. And, and obviously, you know, make sure you tell people, you know, what, what upgrades are going to be included, what support, and all that. And, and that's just kind of also a disclaimer that, you know, that's what users are going to expect. If they're paying for a tool, they're going to expect some upgrades and support. And uh, also consider bundling, perhaps, the tool with other tools or other authors because um, sometimes people will release a, you know, little small tool that's kind of useful, and they'll say, oh, it's, you know, $5 or something. Well, $5 is nothing as far as payment, but it's a huge pain in the butt for people that work at a large company or work in the government because there's a lot of paperwork that goes into buying tools or buying anything. So if, if you're going to make it one of those kind of real cheap tools, then maybe bundle it with some other stuff so that people can buy it more easily. And then if you're going to require payment, you know, make sure you define what you mean by, you know, non-commercial use or commercial use or whatever. And there's all sorts of things to consider, you know, there's development and testing and internal use and consulting use and educational institutions, government entities, all this stuff. So you need to make sure you clarify what you mean by all those terms. And, and again, I recommend, you know, don't, don't disallow you know, redistribution entirely. Um, it's nice to, you know, allow users to email it to their friends or other people they think might be users. And, uh, you know, if, and in the case that the website is, is gone forever, then you know, people redistribute it more widely. And, and again, a lot, make the source code available, regardless of whether it's a commercial product or not. You know, give, give people, the users, the source code and allow them to make modifications for internal use at least and uh, so they can, you know, fix things. Um, allow users to d distribute the modifications to one another that, you know, if you've got, if it's a commercial tool, maybe you should set up an internal type mailing list just for tool users and that they can uh, email stuff to each other. 
And, and if you're going to distribute the source code, obviously make sure it's complete. You've got all the build files and li libraries and stuff like that. And just give a quick how-to of, you know, hey, this is a Visual Studio project. This is how to compile it. And again, make the tool, the license clear, post it on the website. It, a lot of tools that I noticed that you, you couldn't find, figure out what the license was until after you've already downloaded the thing. Well, if it's a, if it's a several megabyte file, then it's kind of a waste of time to have to download it just to figure out what the license is. And, you know, if you're, if you're going to release a uh, news item or post something on a mailing list about the new tool that's available, just include a quick summary of, you know, it's a GPL or it's, uh, you know, free for non-commercial use or whatever. You know, include the, the copying or license file or something like that in the distribution. Um, and in the online help, again, put a little summary there. And if you're going to go to a conference like DEF CON or Black Hat or whatever, you know, tell people when you're presenting. And, um, that's important so that people don't get all excited about something and then figure out that it's, well, it's under some strange license. And, and just for the record, Black Hat and DEF CON are actually really good about that, that I don't think you're allowed to present tools at, at these conferences without a, it being free for at least the conference attendees. But not all um, conferences are like that. And that's just kind of just here. I'll go through this real quick is, you know, make sure that if you're running a conference, you make sure that people know what the licenses are at least and, and consider making it like, like DEF CON and Black Hat that you, if you're going to present a tool it has to be free for at least the attendees. And then uh, the, the big one that I think that we were talking about earlier is that if the people that run online forums that's mailing lists or news groups or whatever, you know, again I'm not a lawyer but I would think that you could you know, come up with like a default license that, you know, if, if stuff is posted to this mailing list without any other license attached, it's going to fall under this license. And I'd recommend making that, you know, the BSD license or an MIT license. So something that basically says you can use it for whatever you want, don't sue me if it breaks something. And, uh, and if, if people are going to patch or post patches to existing tools, then it, it probably makes sense to dual, dual license those under the forums license and also the existing tools license because if that way, if the person who wrote the original tool uh, wants to incorporate that into their tool, then they can do that with no problem. And, and also you want to decide, you know, are you going to let people post things under some different license? Um, in particular, if people are making up their own license that doesn't allow redistribution, then mailing lists, archives and stuff get screwed up. And then just, you know, make it clear to members when they join the mailing list or uh, on the website or for the web form or whatever, or in an FAQ that, that uh, that's what the license is. So that's all I have. Yes, go ahead. Okay, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying there. I guess uh, the, the, his second point was that some tools, especially very expensive tools, <coughs> they don't want to post the price on their website because you can't just download it. You know, you need to talk to them, you need to negotiate a contract, there's usually support that involves, but, you know, that's for tools that are in the thousands of dollars. I'm thinking about tools that are, you know, in the, you know, tens or hundreds of dollars. Well, again, it's like, you know, you, you got to define what you mean by that and all that. But yeah, you know, there's a lot of, you know, especially a lot of the security tools that we use, you know, little command line things that, that shouldn't cost a lot of money. Um, and what was your first point? You said something about cross posting. Uh, yeah, how, how do you determine who the original author is? Uh, yeah, that, that's definitely a problem that if, if stuff has been posted, especially if it's gone through like an anonymous remailer or something like that or an email account that doesn't work anymore, yeah, sometimes you, you can't even figure out who the original author was. So I don't know how to fix that. But I'm hoping that, you know, maybe we can get some forward, some forward uh, thinking into this that in the future this won't be a problem if there is some sort of default license that things will fall under. But again, I'm, I'm assuming that can be done. I'm, again, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know. Any other comments or questions? We've got a couple. We're done. Okay. Okay, well, thanks. If anyone else has any comments, see me.